This is kind of p parallel to my experience. Uh, I've been involved with this from the get-go, and my personal story is I was in my lab for, with, for my weekly lab meeting. I was standing in front of the elevator looking at the bulletin board, and there I see there's a guy who I'd never heard of giving a talk called MRI Guided Transurethral Ablation of the Prostate. And you know, I was a urologist at this hospital, so I called him, and he was a postdoc fellow, Rajiv Chopra, who had this idea and had just been starting to, he was a physicist, is a physicist, started to work in gels, and it was just perfect timing. So we started working with dogs. We did, about, we did this procedure in dogs, and then first in human, and then it led to the profound biotech spinoff. Uh, and here we are today. So this technology has just gotten FDA and Health Canada approval within the last few months, and now it's being rolled out. I have no, uh, I have no investment in the company. I've received some clinical research support. So I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Uh, the, the, the data you're going to see is on whole gland ablation because that is the only way to get regulatory approval these days. But the uh, sweet spot for these technologies, including this one, I think, is really partial gland ablation. And the appeal is uh, non-invasive and lower rate of side effects. So the basic idea is what's called closed-loop feedback of MRI thermometry. So there is this incredibly powerful property of MRI that it can give real-time temperature measurements not of interest under normal circumstances. We're, you know, 37 degrees throughout our body. But if you are using a thermal ablation technique to treat tissue and uh, the ability to actually see what temperature the tissue is reaching with your, with your thermal ablation is extremely powerful. And this gives it the theoretical benefit over HIFU, for example, where you see, you do see some tissue changes, but nowhere near the precision of this. So it is, it's transurethral. It's about an 18 French transducer. Uh, it looks a bit like a 18 French sound. It's got these 10 five millimeter transducers that are independently controlled. A lot of technology has gone into this. And it is focal, not planar ultrasound. So in other words, the the energy is delivered into a kind of narrow beam by each one of these, and it moves out. You see the, I'll show it you in a second, you see the tissue temperature rising. And when your pre-assigned temperature limit reaches the margin, which is typically 57 degrees, reaches the line that you've drawn, that transducer stops generating energy. And when they've all caught up, then it starts to rotate. So that's the basic concept. This is kind of our original a prototype, but basically this rotates the transducers in the patient. It rotates. This is what the thermometry looks like. And uh, this is some of our, and uh, we started this back uh, almost 20 years ago now. It seems incredible, but um, the, the dog data showed that the distance between ablated and normal tissue was only 1.3 millimeters, and we did these treat and resect procedures first in dogs and then in 15 patients. Uh, and the accuracy really very favorable around 1.5 millimeters. There's urethral cooling as well as rectal cooling, so the urethra is spared. Uh, and then we did this treat and resect study in 15 men. Each one was a full day out of my life. Uh, you got, you got uh, three zones, a sort of dense uh, like coagulation zone where the tissue is heated so rapidly that it kind of fused, looked like ground glass and then a little transition area here, the margin then normal tissue. There were no adverse effects. I wasn't sure when we took the first few guys to the operating room, would, would the prostate have been turned to soup or like jello? And in fact, the consistency, consistency, this would be like an hour after the procedure was completed, was, was fairly normal. Um, and then I'll just get to the more recent data. Uh, this is the, was the first uh, safety and precision study which I, they moved it out of Sunnybrook to get this done. And uh, essentially what it showed, PSA dropped quite dramatically, like around uh, something like 90%, as well as the ablation volume. So this really zaps the prostate. The, the reduction in prostate volume is around 90%. It goes typically from about 40 cc's to 4 cc's. 
And again, the, the subsequent data has really confirmed this very tight margin around 1.5 millimeters. And then uh, the, what I'm going to present now, the, the core of this talk, is really this TACT study, which was the pivotal registration trial, 100 and, approximately 115 patients done in uh, five different countries uh, around the world uh, with a pathology endpoint. Uh, meaning uh, MRI and biopsy in all patients around one year after the procedure. And uh, so these were patients, uh, about two-thirds of them grade group two, about uh, one-third uh, grade group one. I was not in favor of that, but I got overruled in terms of the study design. And um, the primary efficacy endpoint was PSA uh, drop more than 75 percent, and in fact, uh, that was achieved in 96 percent of patients, and the median PSA reduction was 95 percent, so really pretty dramatic median PSA nadir 0.34. Prostate volume, I mentioned, 90 percent reduction, and this is the key data, the biopsy data at one year, 111 biopsies in the 115 patients, about 80 percent free of grade group 2 or higher disease. Uh, that's of the patients who, who were grade group 2 at, at the start, 65 percent complete histologic response, and uh, of the ones that were positive, about 40 percent were clinically insignificant. So this is not 100 percent. It's not perfect, but I would say it's still very encouraging. This is also a pretty early experience. A great deal of caution was used in outlining the margin, whole prostate ablation, we, no one wanted to have a fistula, a rectal injury, or anything, any adverse effect. So I would say this partly reflects the conservative approach. Um, so roughly 70, so roughly 80 percent free of significant disease after this therapy. And adverse effects were really minimal. There were a couple of urinary retentions, a couple of ur uh, urinary tract infections, and really that was about it. I just want to show an uh, incontinence dropped transiently and then basically recovered. The functional outcome was very favorable. Same with erectile function, about a 20 percent reduction in uh, erectile function at one year. And this just shows kind of how this works. So you press the, you outline the margin of the treatment and you press the button and you can see all of this, in this case, there's, I think, eight, uh, seven transducers, but you can use up to ten. And the, um, I'm just going to run this again. And you can sort of see here the heat is being generated. You can see the thermal mapping going out to the uh, treatment margin. And, uh, uh, you know, it, you kind of have your heart in your mouth. And this takes, depending on the size here, it's uh, about 40 minutes to treat whole gland ablation. The procedure itself typically takes at least three hours because there's a lot of positioning and sort of precision um, identification by MRI, but that comes down over time. I just want to, this is a patient of mine who developed retention afterwards, so I scoped them. And you can, so far it looks pretty normal. There is the scope going into the bladder. But then you look down here on either side, you've got this like isthmus of spared urethra and a basically huge cavern or cavity. Really, I just found that, you know, absolutely mind-boggling. So uh, to conclude, I mean, I think this looks quite favorable. This is just being rolled out. They're here at the meeting. For those who are interested, I know they're very keen to get rolling. You need to do this as a partner, in partnership with an MRI radiologist. The, if there is a Achilles heel of this technology, it's the complexity. Because you need the MRI, you need good performance of the MRI, the parameters need to be set up. You, you need uh, uh, an MR, experienced MRI person to help you. And then the technology itself has a fair bit of complexity. And that's why it takes a while when you start doing it. We, we typically four hours per case for whole prostate ablation, somewhat less for focal ablation.